Good morning. Hi there. Welcome to Faith This Morning. My name is Kim Hutchins, and I'm excited to see you here. You know, our vision here at Faith is to strengthen families towards a transformed community. And whether you're in-house here this morning or online at faithmuskoka.ca, we invite you into that vision. My name's Jill, and if this is your first time here at Faith, welcome. If you could drop by the Connection Center out in the foyer, that would be great, and let us know that you're here. One of the highlights over the year is our outdoor baptisms. Baptism is a next step that you would take after becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you have been thinking about that, um, and that's something that you have questions on, you can go to our events page and fill out the form there at faithmuskoka.ca, and someone will get back to you with your questions. The baptisms are going to take place on July 29th at Ferry Lake. And again, if you're ready right now to sign up to be baptized, after the service, we encourage you to go out to the Connection Center and you can sign up at the iPads there. Now, for members, tonight, 6 p.m., it is a quarterly business meeting. So we'll see you here tonight at 6. Make sure after the service you pick up your financial report so that you will be prepared for tonight. Summer is almost here, and we have three exciting kids' day camps again this summer. And we are asking if there's anybody out there that's an adult that could help us out anyway, that would be fantastic. I also want to let you guys know that we have so many junior and senior um, students here at the church that really put um, themselves out to come and help volunteer for all sorts of things. And we have so many of them that have volunteered to help out with these day camps. But it would be wonderful if we could get some more adult volunteers to come alongside them to help guide these children. Um, So if that is of interest to you, if you could go out to the foyer at the Connection Center, there's balloons, and somebody from the kids' ministry team will be there to help guide you where you would best fit for that. Well, next week is July 1st, which is Canada Day. And uh, over the past couple of years, we've had people coming to our parking lot and celebrating here, watching the town fireworks, because it is such a great location. So this year, to make it special, we will have some hosts here to um, greet everybody. And so we're asking you in the morning, come out and worship as normal Sunday morning. Then come back at dusk. Bring your friends and your family, and let's celebrate together. Well, again, we are so excited that you're here this morning. And as Jill mentioned, if this happens to be your first time, we have a gift for you that you can pick up at the Connection Center after the service. Because we're really excited to meet you. Our vision here is to strengthen families towards a transformed community. And this morning, Pastor Daryl will continue speaking on Ephesians. And before we get started with some singing, let's stand up right now and greet one another and welcome each other to church this morning. Have a great morning at Faith. Sing this together, guys. Well, I was buried beneath my shame. Well, who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. Keep singing. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my turn till I met you. Sing this out, nice loud. You call.
our voices with all the earth this morning. Let's sing it nice and loud this morning. One voice. Here we go. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you Lord. Let's sing that again. And all is 
for us. There is no other name. There is no other name. Jesus Christ our God. Seated on high, the undefeated one. Mountains bow down as we lift him up. There is no other name. 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 Sing his name. Jesus. Jesus. Sing his name. for your singing. Have a seat just for a moment. So we have come to worship our one King, our one Savior, Jesus Christ. And for those who are followers of Jesus Christ this morning, who have made the decision uh, to follow him, to accept that, that gift of salvation through his death, through his resurrection, there's a great hope uh, for us. And that's a hope for today. That's a hope for all eternity. And today, uh, one of our church family members, uh, uh, Bev Sylvester, is seeing that hope face to face. Uh, Bev passed away yesterday. And uh, so we uh, we lift up in prayer to the Stu and the whole family, the whole Sylvester family. And we want to let you as a church family know, uh, certainly to be praying for them, but also that on Wednesday at 11 a.m. here at the church, uh, there's going to be a funeral service uh, for her. And when we have funeral services here at Faith, this is an opportunity for us to love, to serve uh, the, the, the family as well as their uh, guests. And so if you, if you have on your heart and are interested in coming out and helping to host uh, just some of the, the, the food that we provide after the funeral, uh, that would be amazing. Just call the church office tomorrow or connect with Jen Hutchins. Uh, but we also have the opportunity this morning. Uh, to continue in worship through bringing our tithes and our offerings, and uh, man, it's amazing. We, we've we've kind of quieted. I say quiet down. We're still it's still busy around the church, but to quiet down some some of our ministries around the church. And when you see the hub of activity, I mean, Kim and Jillian were talking about the the youth and the, the junior highs and the senior highs and how they're serving, and it's so exciting just to see what's going on around the church. And awesome, you know, through through the giving of our church family, through the bringing back what is already God's. Uh, we're able to do those things. And here at Faith, there's four ways to give. And uh, there's opportunity to give this morning, but there's also opportunity to give online or text to give. And so use those as your act of worship to God. Would you pray with me? Father, we come uh, with one heart this morning to worship you. And we just pray that uh, the songs that we sing would not, uh, uh, or would be, rather, an offering of praise to you. And uh, we do lift up the Sylvester family. We lift up uh, Stu and the whole, just the whole family, the kids and extended family. And we, we grieve with them. And uh, we also rejoice with them at the great hope that is now sight uh, for Bev. And just go ahead of uh, that family this week and be their peace and be their strength. And we pray that Wednesday is a very special time together uh, for their family, for their guests, for the church family. Father, as we come to worship, we... We just pray that what we bring this morning is truly an extension of our, our songs that we sing in worship and our personal time in worship and in, in your word and in prayer and through the studying of your word. And uh, we do acknowledge that all that we have is yours and uh, that includes what is ours monetarily. And so we bring that back to you and just may it be a representation of the offering of our hearts, Lord. We pray that trusting you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a new song together. It's called Who You Say I Am. It's by Hillsong. You can look it up when you go home. Um, we're learning it together, so just join in. You know, when that offering plate passes you by and you're comfortable, just give it a shot. We're learning it together.
Our God and our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this time that you give to us. We look forward to hearing what you're going to say to us through your word. Father, we pray that as the Spirit of God speaks to us, that we may apply these truths to our lives. May we be changed people as we yield ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to be reading verses 25 through 32. I'd like you to follow along in your Bibles as I read it from mine, and if by chance you forgot your Bibles, the words will appear on the screen behind me. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who, who listen. 
And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Every parent wants to teach their children certain basic skills that will allow them to function properly and get along with others in this world. There are manners that must be instilled, respect for authority that must be conveyed, and of course, certain interpersonal skills that must be developed for a child to maintain healthy friendships and relationships as they grow and as they mature. The Apostle Paul, in all likelihood, is the spiritual father and grandfather to some of the people who he is writing to. And as such, because of his role in that area, he wants to teach them how, as followers of Jesus Christ, how they're supposed to behave in this world. While he was in Ephesus, Paul no doubt led some of these people to the Lord. And they, in turn, led other people to the Lord. And hence, he is the spiritual father and grandfather to the very people who he's writing to. And as any good parent, he wants to teach them. He wants to teach them how they're supposed to behave, how they're supposed to act in this world. Because there are certain practices and behaviors that every follower of Christ needs to demonstrate. And that's what he's talking about here in this section and in the sections that will follow this as well. Now, you've heard me say many times our relationship with God is very important. In fact, it's the most important, the most significant question we are ever going to be asked as to whether or not we are true followers of Jesus Christ. Not only are we to know Christ, but we are to grow in Christ, and we're to grow in our knowledge of Him. And so I'm not in any way minimizing the personal relationship that Jesus Christ wants to have with each and every one of us. But our relationship with one another is also extremely important. How we get along with others within the church as well as outside the church is of interest to God. What Paul has been getting at throughout this entire book is how how God has brought formerly two groups of people who basically couldn't stand one another, the Jews and the Gentiles, and he's actually united them within himself. The passage, of course, is Ephesians chapter 3. We looked at it a few weeks ago, a few months ago now. But in Ephesians 3, we read these words. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. And so there Paul is saying us, these, 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 formerly, these two groups who formerly literally couldn't stand each other, the Jews and the Gentiles, they've been brought together in Christ to form one body. They need to get along with one another. And it's important to point out that what Paul is going to teach us today and in the, the next few uh, sections, chapters here, what he's going to teach us is not a matter of pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. It's not a matter of you saying, well, I'm just going to be determined. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to force myself to, to live this way. No, this is conditional based upon a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He's saying if we want to do this, if we want to live this way, if we want to behave this way, then we, know, we need to know Jesus Christ personally. And, of course, what that means is that we need to have come to a point in our life when we've confessed that we are sinners, that we are separated from God, that we are headed for a Christless eternity, and we've accepted Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection as the only means of salvation. We've received him as our Lord and as our Savior. We've asked for his forgiveness, and we've been accepted into the family of God. That's what Paul is talking about here. It is assumed 
And it's mentioned in these verses that we are followers of Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit of God lives within us, and that we are now part of this new creation of Jews and Gentiles that Jesus has established in himself. And the changes that Paul is looking for will come as a result of being obedient to the word of God, of yielding ourselves to the leading and the control of the Holy Spirit, not as a result of not as a result of our own determination. We're going to do this on our own because we can't do it on our own. So it's important that we understand that before we look at the specifics of what the Apostle Paul says here. But having that as our understanding, as our foundation, if you would, notice what Paul begins or how Paul begins this list. He talks about the importance of telling the truth. Verse 25, Therefore each of you, must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we are all members of one body. Within the body of Christ, there should be no such thing as lying to one another or deceiving one another. That shouldn't exist within the body of Christ. Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount, let our yes be yes. Let our no be no. Let's just be up front. Let's be who we are. And within this context, of course, Paul is referring to those within the church, but there's also a universal application. He's saying we need to tell the truth to everybody. It's not okay to lie to those outside the, truth, outside the church. We, we must also speak the truth to those within the church as well as those outside the church. And of course, lies can appear in so many different forms. As one person said, and I'm not too sure where I got this, says lies often go undercover as exaggeration. You stretch the story to a bit to make yourself look better or to evoke sympathy. One of the easiest lies to fall into is the silent lie. This is where someone assumes something about you which you know to be untrue, but their mistaken view of you makes you look good. So you just let it go by and don't say anything to correct it. In a similar way, we use evasive lies. We change the subject. Or don't directly answer the question. In other words, what this author is saying is we're very creative when it comes to to telling lies. It becomes part of our lives and, and we're not even aware of it after a while. We also have a tendency to rationalize lying by making it at times to appear almost like it's an honorable thing. Well, we lie to protect someone else. We lie in order not to hurt someone's feelings. We lie because we don't want to offend anybody. Now, ultimately, or usually when this kind of discussion goes around, somebody says, well, is it ever appropriate to tell a lie? Sometimes is it, is it not better to tell the lie than to tell the truth? And the example that is usually given, at least in my generation, was this one. If you lived in Germany during World War II and the Nazis knocked on your door, would you tell them, that there were Jews hiding in, your, hiding in your attic. And usually the answer there is, well, no, you would lie about that, and, and so on. Now, granted, those life and death situations are tremendously difficult. It was difficult back then. It's difficult for us today. But not only is it difficult, but I would say today, this type of situation here in Huntsville is rare, if not absolutely non-existent. I can't remember the last time the SS troops walked down my in my neighborhood asking if Jews were hiding in my house. I mean, it just, it just doesn't happen. And yet, we use that argument to justify lies in other areas of our life. No, the kinds of lives we commit have to do with us saving face, not wanting to cause an awkward or an uncomfortable situation. Those are usually the kind of lies that we tell. And it's interesting in this passage here, Paul says lying is wrong, Not simply because it's mentioned in the Ten Commandments, it goes against the very character of God, but he says it's wrong because we're members of the body. We're members of the body of Christ. And when we lie, we hurt the body of Christ. We hurt ourselves. And so Paul says, don't lie. Speak the truth. That's how followers of Christ are supposed to conduct themselves. This is the kind of behavior that God is looking for within each of our lives. You notice the next instruction that Paul gives 
is in regard to anger. Verses 26 to 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Now, the first thing you'll notice here that's implied is that it is possible to be angry and not to sin. It, that, that is possible. However, I believe it's also very rare. Usually when you and I get angry, sin is, is part of that. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, even though it's possible, I think it's, it's extremely rare. Because most of our anger is, is selfish. It, it, basically, we get angry generally for one reason. It's because we're not getting our own way. Generally, that's why we get angry. We don't get our own way, and so we get angry. And even when we claim righteous indignation, rarely is that the case. Most of the time, when we are anger and we express our anger, that expression of anger produces things that are not godly, that are not beneficial to the body of Jesus Christ. That's why in the book of James, James counsels us, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Now, in regard to our anger, Paul actually puts a time limit on this, and it's one that you're familiar with. He says here, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Limit the amount of time that you allow yourself to be angry. And I know so often that's applied in a marriage situation. Often you'll hear that counsel given at, at weddings and so on, that the, the husband and the wife is, is not to go to bed angry. And that's, that's obviously very good advice. But it's talking about much more than just a, a marriage situation. It's talking about any kind of situation that you can, ima that you can imagine. Anger needs to be dealt with quickly. We shouldn't store our anger. We shouldn't allow it to accumulate. Each day before the day is over, we need to confront our anger, and if at all possible, we need to put it behind us. And those who allow anger to build up usually end up making mountains out of molehills. The longer it goes, the more convinced you become of your own position, and the more clouded the issue actually becomes. In fact, I find it interesting in this section here, Paul says that when, we, we, that when we entertain anger, we're actually giving the devil a foothold. Apparently, Satan can use those kind of occasions to create problems in the person. And I think in this context, Paul would say, within the church of Jesus Christ as well. Hebrews 12 verse 15 says, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Do not allow Satan to use your anger to his advantage. Deal with it. Put a time limit on it and put it behind you. The next instructions that Paul gives us in verse 28, he says, he who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Now, I think when Paul says here, steal no longer, I don't think he's talking about the professional thief who robs others in order uh, to make himself a living. I mean, one of the Ten Commandments says that we're, that we're not to steal. I mean, they had the very same custom in, in most cultures, and, and there were laws on the books that forbid this kind of practices. In other words, it would be redundant for Paul to have to repeat something that was generally understood by most of the population. Now, even though it includes, obviously, all of that, I think it goes much beyond that. I think he's referring to those generally accepted practices that many in society simply wink at because it's a common practice. They excuse it in themselves because everybody's doing it. And I think what Paul is saying is we need to be above that. We're not supposed to be doing what everybody else is doing. And if it's wrong, it's absolutely wrong. We need to stop it. 
Today, we could talk about things like some people would cheat on their taxes, being paid in cash to avoid giving the government their, their due, taking extra time at, at lunch hours or, or at breaks, and, and really being paid for, for, for time that you're not using for your employer. I think those are the type of things that as followers of Jesus Christ, we're supposed to be above that. We're supposed to be different, even though other people may do that. You and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, are not supposed to be like that. You notice Paul doesn't end there. He doesn't just say, stop stealing. He goes on and he says, no, not only must you stop stealing, but you need to work in order so, in order that you have something to share with others. See, a, a, a sign of conversion for this type of person is that they go from taking to actually giving from being a drain on society to actually benefiting society. See, generosity, which is what Paul is referring to here, should be characteristic of a follower of Jesus Christ. We should be known as a generous people. 1 Timothy chapter 6 says, Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. That's what Paul instructs us. Moving on, Paul says, verses 29 30, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Basically, what Paul is saying here is, watch your language. That's really what he's talking about. He's saying, watch your language. He's not simply referring to profanity, although obviously he's referring to that. But he's referring to any talk that tears down rather than builds up. As the expositor commentary says, in connection with talk, it may signify not simply bad language, but malicious gossip and slander. Anything that injures others or sparks dissension is covered by that expression. Again, controlling the use of our words is difficult, if not absolutely impossible, from a human perspective. James, again, talks about that in his book. It's a lengthy passage, but, but just let me read it for you. James chapter 3, beginning of verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and, and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Powerful words from James. He's talking about how difficult, impossible it is to actually control the use of our tongue, the, 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 the use of our words. And as we have come to learn, words have power. We can do a lot with our words. Proverbs 18, 21 says, the tongue has the power of life and death. You can give life or you can kill somebody with your words. I never would have even thought about this application, but a couple of weeks back, Pastor Terry actually sent me an article 
warning about how we as believers should be careful how we use our words on social media. We sometimes say things on Facebook or on Twitter that we would never say face to face, or at least we would not use the same tone that we would on the social media. And that's not right as followers of Jesus Christ. Again, we need to be above that. In fact, Paul says here, rather than tearing down, our words actually are supposed to build each other up. See, we should be known for our encouraging words, not our criticism, not our negativity, but the positive things that we bring to a conversation. And I find it interesting here, the grieving of the Holy Spirit is actually associated with, it's linked with how we use our words with one another. Tim Shelley says the Bible dictionaries agree. The Greek word used here indicates grief, sorrow, and distress. So somehow our sin really can bring grief to God. And according to the immediate context, this is especially true for the sins of the mouth that cause disunity between believers. It goes on to say we need to remember that the Holy Spirit is not a distant abstract deity and certainly not an impersonal force. No, the Holy Spirit is a person. For only a genuine and personable being is capable of this kind of thinking, feeling, and emotion. In fact, when we understand that the Spirit is a person, it should surprise us only if if He would not or could not feel grief in the face of our sin. So we can grieve the Spirit of God through the negative conversations that we have with one another. And then Paul says, to make matters worse, the one who we're grieving is the one who has sealed us until the day of redemption. That is, we are actually hurting the one who we owe our eternal security to. Charles Hodge says, not only is his holiness offended, but his love is wounded. We wound the Spirit of God sometimes because of the way we speak to one another. Now, this does not mean, of course, that we lose our salvation. But we do lack the manifestations of the Spirit that should be obvious within a believer's life. The last section here of our passage, Paul basically just kind of gives a summary list and some things to get rid of and then some things to, to make sure are part of our lives. It begins in verse 31. It says, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Paul says, get rid of all of these things. None of these things should be part of our lives. And then he gives the list. He starts with bitterness. Bitterness is is the spite that harbors resentment and keeps a score of wrong. It's the opposite of what he's talked about, uh, about keeping, uh, letting your anger go at the end of the day. This, this keeps a record of it. It builds up over time and, and bitterness sets in. Then he talks about rage. That's what flows from bitterness and an outburst of uncontrolled passion and frustration. Again, he mentions anger, an unjustifiable human emotion that manifests itself in noisy assertiveness, brawling which is probably shouting, getting very angry and losing your cool and letting a person know exactly what you think. It talks about slander, hurting somebody's reputation. Saying something about someone that you know the person you're talking to is now going to have a negative opinion about the person you're talking about. And then he says, every form of malice. Malice is that desire to hurt with words or with actions or with attitudes, or whatever. Just, you just want to hurt that person. Paul says none of those things should be part of a believer's life. We need to get rid of it. And then very quickly, he ends on a positive note. <clears throat> he said, instead, we're to be kind. That's a sweet and a generous disposition. We're to be compassionate, easily or quickly moved to love, pity, or sorrow. It describes one having tender feelings for someone else. And then he says, forgiving each other as God has forgiven us. Just as in Christ, God has forgiven you. See, there's the standard of our forgiveness. The standard of forgiveness is Jesus. 
who while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, who are we to refuse to forgive others when God has forgiven us so much? I began this message by stating that as some of these Ephesians, uh, some of these believers in Ephesus, Paul was actually the spiritual father. And Paul is instructing them how they're supposed to behave as Christians. And again, it's the responsibility of any parent. But as I looked at this list, I thought it's interesting. This is the kind of list that any parent would give to any one of their children. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't get angry. Watch your language. Basic lessons that we teach our children from a very young age. Basic, simple things, but when done in a God-honoring way, they can result in some huge spiritual victories in our lives and in the lives of others as well. So may these little things become big things in each one of our lives. I want to remind you and invite you that if you would like an opportunity to pray with somebody, there will be somebody up here at the front. And if God has spoken to you during this message, or maybe there's something that you just would like some prayer for, or maybe there's a victory that you would like to share with somebody. Somebody will be here. They would love to spend some time in prayer with you at the end of our service. Let's close our time with prayer. Our God and our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the time that you've given to us. We pray that you will remind us of the truth that you've that you revealed to us in your word. Help us to be the kind of people who you want us to be. Help us to live the kind of lives that Paul has talked about here, obvious Christians in the midst of this world. And may you receive all the glory for that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.